appreciate that. Certain times when some of you, some of you men pray, you say things that have been on my heart and are in my notes and <laughs> what I'll be preaching about. So keep that in mind. Carl mentioned praying for the things we take for granted, all right? Thinking about those and considering those things we take for granted. All right, Philippians chapter 1. Now we're, we've been through five verses here. Let's read the first five verses. And then we'll enter into verse 6. You like verse 6, don't you? You like verse 6? You should. You should know verse 6. That's a good one, amen? That's one of the promises of God you can hold on to. But there's a lot in that verse, and in searching the Scriptures and comparing spiritual things with spiritual things, I hope to give you and help you uh, gain a fuller understanding of that verse, because it does mean so much to me. There's, there's a lot of meat there. There's some milk there, there's some meat there, there's something for all of us. Verse 1, Paul and Timotheus, that's me, Amen. That's my Greek name. <laughs> Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ. That's the title I want. That's the title I desire. Not so much pastor, certainly not bishop. I don't want to be called Bishop Tim. Or no. You can call me pastor if you want, that's fine. But I don't seek the praises of men. If you call me a servant of Jesus Christ, boy, that I appreciate that. That means I'm doing something right. Amen. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi. So saints are people that are living and breathing. Got that? They're living, breathing people. All that are in Christ are saints. Amen. Now you saints ought to act like saints. I know it's hard. <laughs> I know it's difficult sometimes. But as saints, we ought to act like saints. And when we're not acting as we should, we need to, to trust the Lord and call upon Him and claim, and claim the blood and get right with Him and get going in the right direction. To all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Now, when we covered that verse, what you have here is a church. Yep. You see that? It's a church. You have a congregation, the saints, and you have bishops and deacons. You have leadership and you have a congregation. Therefore, you have a church. That's what it takes to make a church. You need all those elements to have a church. If I just stand here and no one's sitting there, we don't have a church. You got that? If you're here and you don't have a pastor and you don't have some leadership, you don't have a church. Now, you might have a little fellowship and you can gather around the Word of God but that's not a church. This is a church he's writing to. Now, keep in mind also, I'll mention this again, this is a prison epistle. Paul's writing from a Roman prison. And he's in very good spirits, believe it or not. That's called the fruit of the Spirit. Do you understand? That's what that's called. You know, when everything's just falling apart and nothing's going right and you still have joy and thankfulness and peace, right? That's the fruit of the Spirit. It's supernatural. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father. Now, how could he say that if he didn't understand and know the grace of God and have peace in his soul? He had peace and he had the grace of God. He often wondered, Paul sitting in that prison cell, if he often thought, you know, I deserve this anyways. <laughs> right? I mean, did, wasn't, wasn't Paul the one, Saul of Tarsus? Yeah that rounded up the Christians and put them in prison? Yeah. You reap what you sow. Yeah. That's what Paul said, right? God's not mocked. And here he's sitting in a prison cell, and he's, what? He's, I'm just getting what I deserve. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Well Amen. Yeah. If God gave me what I deserved, it'd be much worse than a prison cell. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here he says this, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Now this gives us some insight into Paul's thought life while imprisoned. This is what he's thinking about. Amen? Now most prisoners, when they're incarcerated, you know what they think about? They think about mama's cooking. 
<laughs> right? They think about, you know, they think about the food that they don't have because the food in prison is nasty. They think about having some, a nice pair of sneakers and some nice clothing and that kind of stuff. That's not Paul. Paul's, Paul's mind and his, mem his thoughts are upon the memories that he has serving the Lord in the ministry. And often he thinks of these Philippians and upon every remembrance of them, every time they come into his mind, he throws up a prayer to God and thanks God for them. He thanks God for them. Amen. I thank God for you guys. I thank God for this church. I don't know where I'd be. Where would I be? I don't know. If I didn't have you, if we didn't have this, I don't know where I'd be. I mean, I pray I'd be preaching somewhere, but who knows? I thank, I thank the Lord for you. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making request with joy. Paul, big smile on his face, just joy and peace in his heart, the grace of God, sitting in a prison cell. That's Paul. People, you can follow Paul. He's a very good Christian example. He tried his best to follow Christ. The example that Christ gave him, Paul just picked up on and just ran with it. And notice in verse 5, he says, For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Fellowship in the gospel. You know what it tells me? I see a lot in this. It tells me you've got to have a church to have fellowship in the gospel. That's part of fellowshipping in the gospel is to have a church. This, this is a fellowship, do you understand? In the gospel. The gospel is the basis and foundation of our fellowship. That's why we exist. We exist to fellowship in the gospel. Now, last week I gave you some things on that fellowship in the gospel and why Paul was so thankful because what, when he delivered the gospel unto them and preached the gospel to them and many of them were saved and then churches were established from that very beginning until the day that he was writing them this letter, they had continued in this fellowship. They had not wavered. They had not drawn back, Right? They've maintained this fellowship in the, in the gospel, this unity that they had, this partnership, this association, this companionship, this company in the gospel. That's us, people. This is our fellowship in the gospel. So the Philippians, I gave you this last week. I just want to remind you they maintained a true fellowship in the gospel with and without Paul's presence, right? When, if Paul was with them, if Paul was not with them, they maintained this true fellowship in the gospel. The gospel was at the center. They rallied around the gospel, didn't they? The gospel is what bound them. That's what bound them together. That was the glue, and Paul, with joy in his heart, thanking God in every remembrance of them, always for their fellowship in the gospel. So what was it that caused Paul to be so thankful and so joyful? Was it just the Philippians or was it the Philippians and their fellowship in the gospel? Don't leave the gospel off. It's what those Philippians did when they received the gospel. And they maintain that fellowship in the gospel. This is what brought such joy and peace and thanksgiving to Paul's heart. And this is what he's writing them about. He's trying to encourage him, isn't he? Keep going. I'm trying to encourage you this morning. Keep going. Have you arrived yet? Have you got to where you've got to the point where you're just a spiritual giant, amen, and your whole life revolves around Jesus Christ, and you've got all the scriptures figured out, and you just, you just know it all, amen? Not me. <laughs> I'm trying to encourage you this morning to continue in the gospel. Because you'll grow. You'll, these Philippians have grown leaps and bounds, and Paul knows that. 
He's, he's heard word one way or another. He's heard word from those that have been with them. And now that he's in prison, he's heard word that they've continued in the gospel. And it's just such joy in his heart that his labors... This is what Paul, Paul's thinking back and he's thinking about them and where they started and where they are now. And this peace that Paul has while imprisoned, knowing that his labors were not in vain. <laughs> and the Philippians are the fruit of his labors in the gospel. Paul kept the gospel at the center, didn't he? That's what he said to the Corinthians, I determined not to know anything among you save Christ Jesus and, and Him crucified. What are you doing with the gospel? I believe if Paul showed up here today, that's what he'd want to know about our church. What are you doing with the gospel? First and foremost. Now you all understand the gospel, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Let me remind you. <laughs> I burn that into your brains, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's the works of Jesus Christ. His perfect, pure, and finished works. Amen. That's the gospel. Amen. That's why we exist. That's what we rally around. That's the foundation of our church. It's His works. We work because He worked. We serve because He served us, right? We love him because he first, loved us. right? It all starts with him. So this fellowship in the gospel. Uh, we know some things about this fellowship and why Paul is so joyful that they've continued in this fellowship. They've supported him financially. Amen? They've supported him financially while he preached to others. They supported him openly in the face of his enemies. They didn't back down, and they prayed for his success in preaching the gospel. And every good church needs some Philippians. Yeah. We got some here, and I praise the Lord for them. Amen. You know what I need? I need you to help me because we're in this thing together. I need you to pray for me, support me. Because we need this church. Amen? And you're part of it. And I'm part of it. And we need to maintain this fellowship in the gospel. All right. Verse 6. Here's the verse. Being confident of this very thing. Confident. What's that word mean to you? If the Bible says you should be confident, then you should be confident, right? In that word confidence, I see assurance. Amen? Yeah. Assurance of mind. There's something that Paul says that you should know. And what you know, you should be confident in. What we have here is a promise. Now, there's many promises of God that you can take to heart, that you can take personally as a child of God that's been born again in the body of Christ, in the church. There's many promises that you can take to heart. But you've got to be confident in those promises. You know, in order for those promises to work their way out in your life and bear fruit, there has to be some confidence. And Paul's saying, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work, notice, in you, will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Now, what's the source of this confidence? What's the source? Let me tell you something. It's not you. You'll never be confident. You'll never be confident. There's not a religious person on planet Earth that's confident of their eternal salvation. Isn't that, isn't that strange? These religious folks in Sioux City, they're not confident of their salvation, are they? You know why? They're not resting in the works of Jesus Christ. 
the source of this confidence that we are to have, look at verse 5, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. The gospel is the source and strength of our confidence. So what do you know about the gospel? You know, there's people that know all kinds of things about the gospel. They just don't believe it. Right. <laughs> Amen? It only effectually worketh in those that believe it, right? right. <laughs> How confident are you in the works of Jesus Christ that he began in you and the works that he will continue to perform until the day of Jesus Christ. How confident are you in his works? We had a, we had a, I don't know if he'll show up. Maybe he'll show up. Russ, we had a, a visitor on Wednesday. And I was preaching and teaching and he just kind of blurted out about having confidence and doubting his salvation. And he had tears in his eyes. If you're saved and you know you're saved and you have a testimony of salvation and then you doubt your salvation, you're doubting the works of Christ. <laughs> you're doubting the sufficiency of his finished work. It says, he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it. You got that? There's a truth that we're given here that you can be confident in, okay? I want you to be confident in this truth that we have here. When Jesus starts something, he finishes what he starts. He's not like some, especially men, that have 20 jobs around the house. It's like, <laughs> right? That's not Christ. When he begins a good work, Hey, when he saved you, wasn't that a good thing? Oh. Your salvation is a product of his good works, right? The source of your salvation is his works. It's not your works. As soon as you put your works into it, guess what? You've corrupted the gospel. And the power in the gospel has been eliminated. You have, there's no power there. There's only power in the gospel when it's the gospel alone. So as a child of God, when I put my faith and trust in his gospel, he saved me. And it was by his power. Now, now it's on me to continue in this fellowship of the gospel. Note that verse 5 and verse 6 are connected there. You see that? Verse 5 and verse 6. For your fellowship in the gospel, you see that? From the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, right? He, that's Jesus, that began, that hath began. That's the first day. Look at verse 5. That's the first day. A good work. That's the fellowship in the gospel will perform it. That's Jesus the performing the work. You know, when we rally around the gospel and the gospel's at the center and we go out there and we preach the gospel, it's Jesus performing that. See, don't think it's you. If you didn't have the gospel and you didn't know the truth, would you be out there preaching the gospel? Don't think it's you. We think too highly of ourselves. We think it's all about us. No, it's him performing that work through us. And this is what's caused, this is what's brought such joy and peace with Paul. That when the Philippians got it, man, they just ran with it. And they continued in it. They got a hold of the gospel, and that thing just got a hold of them. And the power of the gospel worked its way out of them and through them. Remember, you're just the vessel. You're just the instrument. Am I right? Who's the potter? Who's the sculptor? I mean, who's the grand architect in this whole thing? It's not you. <laughs> you're the clay, you're the paintbrush, right? 
That's what you are. Is that the renewing day by day, the will performing? That's, that's the Lord. That's the power of the gospel. So what he does here, he enlightens them and he encourages them. Let me just say this. He enlightens them. He's opening up their understanding. And I want, you to, I want our understanding to be opened up. When you labor for the Lord, it's not you. It's him through you. Okay? It's him performing that work. And the source of that work and the source of this fellowship and the source of that labor is the power of the gospel. It's the inner workings of God within you. And it's that work within that works its way out. So he enlightens them. He's trying to help them to understand it's not about you, Philippians. It's about him that is in you performing the work through you, the vessel. Right? The tool. And we ought to be vessels of honor. And then he encourages them by letting them know that he which hath begun a good work in you, he'll perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Right? He's trying to encourage them. You know what? He is going to finish what he started. Your salvation, it's in good hands. Did you know that? You know, take your salvation, take eternal life, all those promises that are associated with salvation, just put them in Jesus' hands and say, Lord, those are up to you. Yep. Right? And if that thing gets a hold of you, it works its way out, Amen. doesn't it? It works its way out. It gets a hold of your heart and out of your heart, right? All the issues of life, it works its way out, doesn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And then you just become, you become a manifestation of the gospel, right? Yes. I, so. I had a word down here. What was the word that I had? An extension. That's the word. That's what you are. You're just an extension of the work that Jesus began in you. You're just an extension of the work that he's continuing to perform in you, right? Aren't you glad that your salvation's not up to you? <laughs> I, I, I mean, aren't you thankful that your salvation is not up to your performance? Is your performance always on par? You always got your A game, right? I don't, <laughs> right? But thank the, thank the Lord, my performance, my salvation is not contingent upon my performance. It's kept by His power. Your salvation's in good hand, so now you stay faithful. That's the Philippians. They stayed faithful in the fellowship of the gospel. Your salvation's in good hands. He will keep it. He will perform it. Now you stay faithful to it because He will. I can promise you that. He will being confident of this very thing. Do you have confidence in the sufficient work of Christ? If you do, you never doubt your salvation. If you do, you put your old life behind you and you walk in newness of life. If you do. Where's the struggle at? There's still that struggle that you think you got it figured out right and you think that, you, that you, you're, the master, you're the master of your life and you can lead your own life and you better just surrender to the gospel. Say, Lord, I'm taking my life and taking everything I got and putting it in your hands because I, I can trust you with it. I can't trust myself. People, you can be confident he will remain faithful to you unto the end. We just sang about that. We just sang about that. And you know, we should, we should afford the Lord the same confidence. He should be confident in us. He should be able to trust you. Yeah. Amen? You know how the Bible says we're stewards? Stewards of the mysteries. God has given us a, a very, very important responsibility that we're to be stewards of and maintainers of. And that was these Philippians. They were good stewards of the gospel, weren't they? And Paul rejoiced. Paul rejoiced. So the person of this good work is pretty clear. It's Christ. 
he is to say he, trying to break this ver verse down a little bit. He that hath begun a good work in you. Who's the he? It's not you. So if it's not you, who is it? Well, look at the ver first verse, servants of Jesus Christ, right? It's him. It's Christ. He's the person of this good work, the person who performed the good, the good work of the gospel. Who performed the work of the gospel? Only one person. You know, that's what makes Christianity so simple. I mean, I understand, there's some complex things about this Bible. I don't understand it all. But when it comes down to the bare bones, just the basics of Christianity, it's so simple. Isn't it? Yeah. Who performed the works? Anyone else? Nope. That's it, right? It's done. It's finished, right? Did he complete what he started? Well, he said it's finished. Three and a half years is ministry finalized on the cross, and then he didn't stay down, right? And he's alive today. Amen. And his living spirit is within his children. That's good stuff, isn't it? Has that thing got a hold of you yet? The person of this work is Christ very clear in the spirit of Christ how about the power of this work the power of this work look over in Hebrews chapter 13 let's just look at a few verses here Hebrews chapter 13 I want you to see something here now remember our verse there in Philippians 1 and verse 6 being confident of this very thing and that confidence has everything to do with your faith, your firm belief in the works of Jesus Christ, in the sufficiency of His works to save your soul and to keep you saved until the day of Jesus Christ, right? Until the day of redemption. I'm looking forward to that day. What do you know about that day? You get a new body. Amen? Holy Spirit, the down payment, right? The down payment, you're going to get a new body. A body like unto the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have that body yet. If you had a glorified body now, you'd never die. And if you had a glorified body, maybe you've heard me say this before, but your heart wasn't converted, you'd be a menace. <laughs> You'd be dangerous. You just pass through walls. You'd be in the next bank. Tonight, <laughs> there'd, be, there'd be so many temptations, wouldn't it? One day you're getting a glorified body like Christ. And your heart will be perfect like Christ. And you'll have the mind of Christ. And you'll no, no, you'll no longer know in part. You'll, be know, you'll know as He knows you. You'll have a full knowledge. Your mind's going to explode, amen? <laughs> and you will worship Him then. You will know why, and it's all because of Him. You know why you're saved? It's all because of Him. You know why you, you continue to be saved and you remain saved? It's all because of Him. You know why you'll be saved in the end? It's all because of Him. Amen. Amen. Philippians just got a hold of that thing and said, man, this is great, man. We've got to tell the world. <laughs> We've got to tell everybody. Right. Here comes persecution. That didn't stop them. I mean, we're talking about many years from the time that they began to the time that Paul's writing this letter. I said last week in the book of Philippians, you don't find much in the way of rebuke. No. It's a good church, man. They weren't like the Galatians that were so soon removed from the gospel unto another gospel. Wavering, right? That's not the Philippians. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. So the person of this good work clearly is Christ. How about the power of this good work? Where's the power? Where's the source, right? Where's this power come from? 
People, you're going to need some internal strength and power to remain faithful to the gospel, to resist the devil, to resist temptation, right? To not run with this world, to not run and walk the course of this world. You're going to need, you're going to need an internal strength and power. And the gospel that saved you is still in you. That power's there. That work is still working in you. Tap into it, man. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13, look at verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. You see that? Isn't that good? That's a good one. What's that word covenant mean? Isn't that a promise? You know, God made a covenant with Abraham. Everlasting covenant. He made a covenant with me too. An everlasting covenant. It's a blood covenant. Blood covenant. You know how the gang members back in the day, cut your hand, cut your hand, shake hands. We're blood brothers, right? It's kind of along those lines, but it's, it runs much deeper. <laughs> There's plenty of blood brothers that turned their back on their brother and ratted them out, right? <laughs> this is an everlasting covenant. Now notice verse 21. Let's read verse 20 again. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Don't tell me there's not power in the blood. Amen. We sing that song, right? Don't tell me there's not power in the blood. There's power in the blood covenant. See, the promise. There's power in the promise. I think the Philippians got a hold of that. They got a hold of the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us of all sin. They got a hold of that thing. And it got a hold of them. And they came to, they came to the realization and they, they experienced the peace in knowing the confidence in trusting in the all-sufficient works of Christ, the gospel, not only to save them, but for every good work to do His will. Look at the next couple words here. Working in you. Now, you know that's associated with the blood, right? You know that's associated with this everlasting covenant, right? You know that's associated with this promise, right? Has a, has one of, has, has a promise of God ever worked in you? If it works in you, it'll work its way out, won't it? It'll begin to stir you up. And then work its way out. So we have this blood covenant. Make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight. That's what's being worked in you that works its way out of you that God sees. You know what God appreciates? He appreciates the works of His Son. Amen? He accepts the works of His Son. He glorifies the works of His Son. You know what Jesus said? I don't know the exact words, but something along these lines. He said, Father, I've glorified you. Now it's time for you to glorify me. And how did God the Father glorify His Son? He hung Him on a cross. And that blood flowed, didn't it? And that blood flowed on your behalf because of you for your sake, didn't it? And then when you received Christ, you entered into this blood covenant and this promise that covers all your sins. And if that's the source of your works, guess what? Your works will be well-pleasing in His sight. Because the source is the works of Christ. We work because He worked. 
we serve because He served us. We love Him because He first loved us. We give Him our life because He gave us His life, right? right. The source. Make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ. See, if your works are not through Him, then He's not working through you. <laughs> That's how it works. It's through Him, then through you. It's always Him first. Mm -hmm. Now, you know this generation. We're living in a me-first generation. Yep. And the fruit of the works of a me-first, I, 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 me, 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 is not well-pleasing in the sight of God. But the power, the power of this work is within his works. It's within His blood. It's within the gospel. You know Romans 1.16? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. People, that belief doesn't stop after your salvation. Do you understand? That's right. you know, a lot of Christians are like that. It's like, I'm saved and I'm just happy being saved. I'm never going to do anything ever again for Jesus Christ. I just, the only reason I came to you is just to be saved. <laughs> I don't know if that person got saved. You can believe in vain. <laughs> you can believe in vain. Well, maybe they did. <laughs> I don't know, but you can believe in vain. But the power of the gospel is not only to save your soul... But it's to, it's to help you in your continuation and fellowship in the gospel. Amen, the gospel can help you in, in every aspect of your life. Every day. The works of Christ in you that he began and he's promised to perform unto the day of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Are you sealed unto the day of redemption? Right. With the Holy Spirit of promise, right? Yes, so the power of this good work is within the gospel. The person is Jesus. The power is within his works. And then the place of this work is within. That's where God works. You know why? That's why a lot of folks, they stay out of church. Yep. And they, cer they certainly steer clear of a Bible-preaching church. Because the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, and it's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces even to the dividing asunder of joints and, and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That book has a way of just getting in you and cutting deep. You know what it does? It gets to the root of the problem. It gets to the source and the root of the problem. And people don't like that. They don't like someone digging around down in their, in their, in their secret places, right? They don't, they, don't like, they, don't, they don't like things that open up the doors to the skeletons in the closet and all that stuff. That's what the Bible does. So they'd rather put their headphones on, listen to their music, or watch movies, or do drugs, or drink, just, blah, just tune it out, man. I don't want... That book just cuts deep. Amen. But it's for your own good. You, it's for your own good. The person of this work is Christ. The power of this work is the gospel. And the power of the gospel is within you. And what extracts or what brings it out are the promises of God. When you lay hold on those things and you're confident, remember our verse, being confident, not wavering. In the word confidence, there's no wavering. You have to know something to be confident in it, right? So this speaks of knowledge. What do you know about the works of Christ and what do you know about what he did in you? What do you know about this work that he's performing in you that he'll continue to perform until the day of redemption? What do you know about the gospel? 
Did, do you just know enough to get saved and praise the Lord you got saved? Amen. Praise the Lord you're born again. But what about your everyday life? What about you now living for Him? What about you now being an instrument in His hands, a tool in His hands, a vessel of honor for Him? The power to do so is in the gospel. And you need to get a hold of it every day. And that thing ought to get a hold of you. And it's in you. It's in you. Don't go look at anywhere else in the world. If you're saved, the power to live for Jesus Christ and to live well-pleasing to Him in the sight of God, it's in the gospel and it's in you. And we're not to be ashamed of it, are we? Not to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. The gospel can save you for eternity. The gospel can save your marriage. <laughs> are you hearing me? The gospel can save your kids. The gospel can save you from addiction. The gospel can save you from pornography. The, the gospel can save you from anything. Because when you get a hold of what Christ did for you, and that thing gets a hold of you, you'll run from sin. And sin will be dirty. It is. It will. Yeah. And you'll feel the weight of it. Yes, sir. You know, Jesus felt the weight of sin. Yes, sir. Well, every sin was laid upon him. Well, that's a heavy weight to carry. Yeah. Only he could carry it. Amen. Maybe you've been there before you were saved. You know, every sin, it's, just, it's, another, it's another pebble. <laughs> I mean, you put enough pebbles in the backpack, guess what? That thing gets heavy, doesn't it? That's where a lot of folks that are deceived, they'll want, run to religion. They'll run to a man and try to help them. Hey, the, no man but the man Christ Jesus bore your sin. And only he can lighten the load. But the gospel can help you in every area of your life. Because you'll desire, when that thing gets a hold of you, what Christ did for you and what he continues to do keeping you saved by His power, when that thing gets a hold of you, guess what? You'll desire to fellowship in the gospel and unite. You get going in the same direction that He's going. You know, God's going in one direction. You can either get on board or you can just go do your own thing. But many years ago, I decided, you know what? I'm done. I'm just so done with running my life, man, it gets old. It's getting real heavy. And just take your cares, cast them upon him, say, Lord, I'm just going to follow you now. And then the load begins to get lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. Right? Yeah. Because Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burning is light. Yeah. Being confident of this very thing, are you confident? How confident are you in your salvation? How confident are you in the gospel? That the gospel is the answer. It's always the answer. It's what he did for us and what he continues to do. One step into eternity, you'll know. You will know. I'm here 100% all because of him. <laughs> it's not me and you, buddy. Look what we did, Lord. Uh, 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 uh. It's by his grace. Being confident in this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Look over in chapter 2 real quick. One more verse I wanted to mention here. Now, there's so much more that could be said about this verse. I mean, we could... We could go into detail with the work of Christ when He saved you, the seed that was sown, the new birth, the new creature. I mean, all these things. The renewing. He renews you day by day. He keeps you saved. He, he maintains your salvation. You think Jesus would maintain a good house? You think He would maintain a good, keep it nice and clean and tidy, wouldn't He? Well, your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen? He's taking care of your soul. That's your inward man. 
You're a new man in Christ. He's taking care of that thing. It's clean. It's washed. You know, I think it's in 2 Corinthians, I think it is, where it says there's a natural body and a spiritual body. Right? Every man has a spiritual body. They don't have to believe it. It's true. <laughs> they don't have to believe it. Their spiritual body is going to leave their natural body. But a spiritual body that's saved is sealed, and the blood of Jesus Christ, spiritual blood, flows through the veins of that body. You know how the life of the flesh is in the blood? The life, of, the life force of my new man is the blood of Jesus Christ. He's maintaining my health. I'm very my new man is healthy, healthy, healthy. My old man, not so healthy. <laughs> Philippians 2 and verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, wow, <laughs> Not as in my presence only. Remember I mentioned, not just when Paul was around. Like, here comes Paul. Let's start fellowshipping in the gospel again. Right? Let's get our act together. Paul's going to come around. Let's clean the house up. Paul's coming, right? Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Wow! Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I've preached on that verse and we've taught things on that verse, but you can't work out what you don't have. Can't work out what you don't have. You know, those people in Sioux City brush elbows with every day, they don't have salvation. They can't work it out. They don't have it. <laughs> now, they can be saved and after that, they can work it out. But that's you. You're to work that thing out. That's the fruit of the gospel being manifested through you. And the world ought to see it. Right? Because we're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the power of God unto salvation, right? The world ought to know. The world ought to see it. The fruit of the gospel. And when you get a hold of the gospel like the Philippians did, guess what everybody in Philippi knew? That's some crazy Christians. <laughs> you know they did. Paul's rejoicing that they continued in it. They just continued in Paul's work. What did Paul do? He was a fool for Christ. Everywhere he went, it was Jesus all the time. It was the gospel all the time. That was the Philippians. Work it out. Because if you have it, you can work it out. And if you have this salvation, guess what? Jesus is going to continue to keep it and perform it until the day of redemption. And it's from that that we work. It's from that that we live and move and have our being because of Him. That's why we exist, because of Him. And that's why this church exists, because of Him, right? All right. I think we went a little long. Praise the Lord. Let's take five minutes.